So, in the last class we have started discussing about the advanced surface characterization techniques and I have introduced to you the subject, given different examples from our own studies showing the importance of the surface characterization techniques from the perspectives of material science engineering. So, we need to now go into details of each of these techniques. The first one which we will discuss is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy or what is known as XPS in the literature. Many of these uh, slides which I am going to show you can be uh, actually seen in this first book which is by Terry Burr uh, published in 1994. But in the encyclopedia also you can get a lot of information. First one is what is XPS? XPS as I said it is known as X-ray photo electron spectroscopy. That means you have X-ray source and photo electron as the output. That is very clear is it not? So, what is actually done? As you know photoelectric effect was discovered long back almost like 90 years back in by Sir Albert Einstein and he received a Nobel Prize because of the this discovery. In the photoelectric effect normally if a photon of certain energy suppose H nu falls on a photoelectrically sensitive material the photoelectricity is generated because of the production of electrons. That is what is shown in the first slide. You see there is a light source with energy of the photon quanta which is coming as energy of H nu and this can actually eject out electrons from the photoactive elements and that can produce electricity. Fine. So, that same thing can be used to make photo electron spectroscopy, the source which can be used in the photo electron spectroscopy is not the photon, but an x-ray. So, this was done by K. Sagmund Sagman in and he received Nobel Prize after 60 years of Einstein's discovery. Both of these two scientists are from Germany and uh, the Sig Sigmund uh, received Nobel Prize in 1981 for the discovery of this. So, what is done here? You have a X-ray photon coming from an X-ray source. It can be any actual X-ray source like copper or nickel or chromium or iron and this X-ray photon falls on a certain suppose molecule here is an oxygen or certain atom actually oxygen atom and then because of its high energy it is ejects one electron from the inner cell that is one a cell of the oxygen atom and this electron comes out this electron is basically oxygen one electron photo photo ejected electron and we can use this electron to study different kinds of you know behavior different kinds of aspects of the spectroscopy. That is what is the key basic principle of the technique in a nutshell what I can say you. So, and as I said in the last class also this is known as ESCA electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis, but it has different acronyms like XPS except photo electron spectroscopy or UPS if you use ultraviolet as a source of energy ultraviolet photo electron spectroscopy or you can use a photo light like photo, so which can lead to emission of electrons then it is called a photo emission spectroscopy. But we are going to discuss these two mainly. So, we are not going to discuss what will happen if you use ultraviolet or photon light actually and then produce spectroscopy. Well, what is actually the process? What is actually the analytical methods? Let us show it in terms of energy diagrams. What I am showing here is basically energy levels of certain atom. You can see 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s like that. So, 1s has 2 electrons, 2s has 2 electrons and then 2p has 6 electrons in the shells. So, then you have 3s which is unfilled and then you have balance band after that you have a Fermi level. So, and below Fermi level actually all the uh, specified levels of the energy levels are occupied by atoms uh, electrons sorry and then you have E v 
at a higher level then basically EF by difference of phi, phi is known as work function as you know that from the Einstein's theory. So this is what is called kinetic energy, this is what is called binding energy. Now if a photoelectrons or X-ray actually comes and falls on this atom and it ejects suppose one of the electrons in a 2p shell and this electrons then has sufficient kinetic energy to travel to this valence band and may even pass the Fermi level and come out this is known as photoelectron. So we can calculate the kinetic energy of the photoelectron as H nu which is the incident energy of the photon minus Eb, Eb is basically the binding energy plus phi, phi is the work function. So this is work function you know and Eb is basically binding energy that is how we denote. So that means the binding energy is the energy with which this electron is bound to the nucleus. So that means excess XPS spectrum basically can always plot the energy or the intensity of the photoelectrons I versus either the binding energy that is Eb or the kinetic energy they are related as you can see phi is that is work function for the material is well known h nu is the energy of the incident x-ray that is also well known. So therefore the two things which can vary is the Ke or Eb depending on which atom which electron you are rejecting out. So that is why the XPS plots basically will be intensity versus either Eb that is the binding energy or kinetic energy that is how the plots are met. Now what all we can do with this? So this is basically the principle which I told you that is how things are actually happening inside a material and as you know why it is called surface characterization tool. As you know this electron photoelectron which is coming out from the sample will have energies uh, no, something kind of energy not very high. So therefore if it is ejected deep inside the sample then this electron may not be able to come out from the sample surface and we cannot analyze. That is why we use surface actually characterization uh, this technique is used for surface characterization tool. Now what all we can do? We can do elemental identification obviously because we know what is the exact energy of the electron which is coming out. So we can categorically say which ele element is present. We can actually even tell chemical state of the element that is whether it is a oxidized, reduced what kind of state it is or it is a neutral. We can actually measure the relative composition of the constituent in the surface region and we can actually obtain valence band structure. In fact nowadays we can actually do mapping of different elements present on the surface in the surface. So therefore lot of things can be done in the XPS that is why XPS is considered as a versatile tool. Now before I get inside into the other things of XPS let me just explain a little bit about what is RGR because RG is also used in the purpose. Let us see what can be done in RGR. So this is what is this the first picture is basically correspond to the XPS as you see K electron case level L1, L2, 3M then, then the Fermi level then the vacuum level that is EV and these two are differentiated by work function. <coughs> okay, so now an X-ray falls and eject electron comes out this whole thing is known as XPS right. Now in this case the, the last picture the last basically schematic diagram what is happening if you see if this becomes vacant by ejecting the electrons out by the X-rays and higher level electron higher level means suppose at L1 level electron can fall back into the K level and thus creating releasing certain energy when this comes to this some energy will be released and this energy then can be used to knock out an electron at a higher much higher energy level that is L2,3 this electron will have sufficient a little bit of kinetic energy not as high as the XPS electron x-ray photo 
ejected electron, but it will have certain energy. This electron is known as Auger electron. So, therefore, in a nutshell, I can say Auger electron production is totally different from the from the photo extra photo electrons spectroscopy. Here, basically, jump of the electron from a higher level to lower level leads to production of certain other energy H nu 1, which can basically eject and the electron from L 2 3 cell and that electron comes out from the sample surface is known as Auge electrons. So, obviously, the kinetic energy of this Auge electron is much lower than the XPS. That is why Auge spectroscopy is always done from the region near to the sample surface. You cannot actually probe little inside the sample surface, whether XPS can be used to probe the sample surface which is deeper compared to Auge here. So, that is why XPS and Auge these are complementary tool very uh, you know widely used. Remember Auge was discovered by Auge here. So, that is why this process is named after him. We are going to discuss this Auge spectroscopy in detail. So, let us not talk about this right now, but for the sake of your understanding I am just going to tell you what is Auge spectroscopy. Now, let us me go back to the XPS again. In XPS binding energy reference is like done like this. Let us do that. So, this is a sample they have a core electrons, then have a binding energy. Binding energy means this is what the electrons are there. Then this is as a Fermi level as I said E f and there is a work function. Then you have a vacuum energy level. Okay. So, once the x ray falls it, it basically crosses the binding energy then Fermi level then this work function comes out that is how actually you get kinetic energy of the XPS as this H nu minus B f minus phi of the sample. So, and that is basically uh, then you know if in a case of spectrometer what happens there is a vacuum level then there is a spectrometer work function. So, this needs to be you know subtracted. So, basically is depends the kinetic energy is basically when this comes to the electron falls on a spectrometer kinetic energy becomes like this H nu minus B f minus phi spec because Q sample phi sample phi sample basically cancelled out. So, finally, we get binding energy is basically equal to binding of the electron H nu is the energy of the incident photon the X ray photon minus the kinetic energy minus the phi spectrometer. Now, as you know this is fixed well known in a very particular spectrometer this is the fixed also because we know the what is the incident energy of the X ray. So, basically what is varying is this and this or these two are dependent. So, now we can actually calculate if I know this the kinetic energy or if I know the kinetic energy we can calculate binding energy. Basically what we measure is the kinetic energy of the electron and that can be used to calculate the binding energy which is present in the electron. So, that is how actually we can characterize the electron which is uh, ejected out. How the instrumentation is done we are going to discuss in detail later on, but, but to show you that. So, what you have is basically you have a lot of different stops are there here this is the basically heart of the system you have a sample you have x ray gun and uh, you can have electron gun basically x ray has always electron gun and then you have a ion gun to basically uh, you know clean the sample surface many times you can use argon ion uh, because this is done inside a vacuum chamber. So, once the electron are ejected this passes through this electrostatic transfer lens this is what is shown you here and then it is basically goes through a hemispherical uh, you know portion and then falls on the electron channel electron channel electron multiplier which is nothing but basically a gate and then it is getting multiply uh, amplified the signal through when it passes through this multiplier and then it is re recorded uh, you know after it passes through red meter it recorded and you get a plot between intensity versus kinetic energy or intensity versus binding energy that is what is shown you here. Well, that is actually simplest possible thing, but it is not so then you have a control unit and there are many other stops related to it, but this is what is done. Remember it is done in a very high vacuum system because electrons needs to travel through this that is why we need a very high vacuum system vacuum level should be to the minus 10 9 tor and uh, we need also any kind of surface confirmation or the surface reactions. So, that is why uh, you know X rays energies which are allowed to fall on the samples to be tailor. So, that there will be no surface reaction or contamination formed because of the X ray falling on the sample surface. 
Well, let me show you the typical XAXPS spectrum. I am going to show you two spectrums, one from our own, other ones from taken from the literature. As I said in the last class, we have been working lots on the hydroxypatite and hydroxypatite metal that is titanium composites. So, from the surface, the spectrum is taken both from hydroxypatite and hydroxypatite titanium composites. It is basically intensity versus binary energy plot. Intensity is in arbitrary units that is called the basically the energy, uh, the number of counts CPS, sometimes we call CPS counts per second, and binary energy is always written in the units of electron volts. So, as you see, we can see different peaks as usual any spectroscopy have a background and a peak okay. and the most intense peak coming from both the sample is oxygen 1s for which I have already discussed with you. Then you have a peak coming from carbon 1s which is basically used as a standard in a, in a XPS because you know all samples of some kind of carbon. So, you are going to see these peaks. So, many times the spectrometers actually are, are basically calibrated using this peak position. Then because it is a hydroxypatite, hydroxypatite is a formula of CA10 PO4 all to OH all to okay. So, uh, as you see there are phosphorus, there is calcium, there are oxygen, there are hydrogen, hydrogen normally not detected and you have you, you see oxygen peaks, calcium peaks is here, calcium 2P 3 by 2, calcium 2P half, we are going to discuss what is the meaning of that. This are present both in hydroxypatite titanium, uh, the titanium. Then you have phosphorus peaks, P2P and P2S, coming uh, in this in these positions. And altogether you have basically little bit of titanium peaks here. You can see carbon one as a carbon two s will be present always. This titanium peak is not visible here, but little bit small peak is visible here. So that's how we can say titanium is present. But basically titanium is not present as a metallic state its presence as a oxide state or basically oxidized state. So, that is actually how this XPS spectrum looks like and we can analyze different things from this. We can calculate the element present, the chemical state of the element present and we can calculate the percentage of the particular element present by calculating the area under the peaks. We can calculate in fact the chemical shift because of the binding of the elements with any other things, lot of lot of other things can be done which is the part of the topics of this lecture. Typical XPS spectrum for indium phosphide 110 surface, as you see here you see only indium and phosphorus peaks, you see indium 3s, indium 3 1 by 2, this is 3 p 1 by 2, this is 3 p 3 by 5, 3 d 3 by 2, this is 3 d 5 by 2. Okay, this is 3 by 2, this is phosphorus, phosphorus which we will call as have a high binding energy spend the indium as you know, phosphorus 2s, phosphorus 2p, phosphorus sorry indium 4p, indium 4d. So, indium has 3s, 3p, 3d, 4p and 4d, phosphorus has 2s, 2p peaks which is clearly detected and then you have a background in this, that is how actually the peaks uh, the, the spectrum looks like. I hope things are clear in your mind how XPS works and how the spectrum looks like because we are going to use this spectrum. Now to give you more idea, let us look at a very high atomic number elements like uranium and talk about binding energies and ionization cross sections. This is binding energy versus ionization cross sections as you see here different kind of energy levels are there. You have 4 p 2 spins 1 and a half and 3 by 2, 5 d 3 by 2. Okay, 5 d 3 by 2 is small also there and this is different than 5 p half, 5 s and 5 d. On the other hand f levels are there also, so f 5 by 2, f 7 by 2. You can see the ionization cross sections are very high, ionization cross section means how much uh, you know energy electrons are created after you ionize with this x-rays, very high for 4 f electrons followed by 5 4 d then 5 d and 4 p. Other energy energies are very low for these electrons like 5 d, 5 p, uh, 5 p and 5 d and 5 s because they are very close to the Fermi level. So, that means the electron yield, photo electron yield by x-rays, x spectroscopy will depend on uh, this ionization cross section that means this will be higher 
if for these energy levels for case of I uranium then others. So, that means we can do such a kind of analysis for all elements and then figure out whether this actually happens in a particular system or not. Well, now let us get into nitty gritties of that as you see for P, D and F peaks there are always two peaks that are observed. Here you see for gold 3 4 D 3 by 2 and 4 D 5 by 2 please I mean that means D peaks are actually comes as a doublet separation between these two peaks are named as a spin orbital splitting. The values of the spin orbital splitting of a core level of an electron in different compounds are nearly same you must remember this this is very important that means values of the spin orbital splitting this is the spin orbital splitting value this is for a core level electron in different compounds are nearly same peak ratios peak area ratio that means this is the peak area for these two electrons peak area ratios of a core level uh, of an electron element in different compounds are also nearly same these two are very important. Now, I have not discussed what is the spin orbital splitting I am going to do that, but this is what we observe and we have seen some of the some of this uh, you know patterns. The spin orbital splitting and the peak area ratios assist in any mental identification ok. Now, let us look at what is it what is spin orbital splitting this is first to tell you how actually done you know electron has a up spin or down spin it is half minus half plus half. So, what do you do here? basically use something known as ls coupling we do not use only s as you know the principal quantum number n l s all these things you are very aware of it. So, l and s s actually talks about the spin of the electrons. So, here we are using l and s coupling. So, this number j j is what is this number 3 by 2 1 by 2 is basically l plus minus s as you know s can be either plus half or minus half depending on the spin. So, if you have this kind of situations one up and down. So, one is up is called plus up down is called minus half. So, in this case one is up it is basically j equal to l plus half if it is down it is j is equal to l minus half ok. So, first one the way picks and notice is first is the principal quantum number. 2 p ok as you know 1 1 s 2 s 2 p 3 s 4 p that is how the quantum principal quantum number actually goes. So, first one first digit in a peak notation is corresponds to n uh, the principal quantum n second one corresponding to l the magnetic quantum number that is p s d f there are 4 sets as you know and so that is that means s is equal to what is basically s is equal to 0 p equal to 1 d is equal to 3 f equal to 3 uh, sorry d equal to 2 f equal to 3. So, that means p is equal to 1. So, it is 2 corresponding to n principal quantum number n p corresponds to what 1 then if it is 1 plus half the electron is up spin then it is positive. So, it is become 1 plus half equal to 3 by 2 correct. So, that is what is shown here when L equal to 1 that is for P cells either it is P 1 by half or P 3 by half if it is P 1 by half that means P 1 minus half 1 is basically L and minus half is basically down spin. So, that is what is that and then here it is P 1 plus 1 half that is 3 by 2. So, 1 is corresponding to the L uh, P equal to 1 that is this magnetic quantum number azimuthal quantum number not magnetic quantum number sorry azimuthal quantum number and half is basically coming from up spin. So, it has been found that area ratios that is what we have been discussed of these two peaks will be 1 is to 2 that means 3 by 2 will be double area having double area than the 2. Now, D I will D correspond to L equal to 2 right. So, if L equal to 2 so that means D it will be 2 minus half that is d 3 by 2 where minus half is corresponding to down spin right and otherwise it will be 2 plus half then half plus half corresponding to up spin this is how actually we are designating area ratios of these two 
split spin orbital splitting is 2 is to 3 and then f corresponding to l equal to 3. So, l equal to 1 power p l equal to 2 power l uh, p d and l equal to 3 power f. So, as you see 3 minus half will be 5 and half. So, that becomes down spin electron and 3 plus half will be 7 by 2 that is will up spin electron. Area ratios of these two peaks after splitting will be 3 is to 4. So, in a nutshell this slide is that is why it is very important for you to understand in a nutshell we can actually obtain spin orbital splitting information in XPS and this is how things are designated this is how things are actually you know peaks are uh, marked in the XPS spectrum. Now, let us look at you know how we can use this for gold. Gold has you know it has 4s, 4p, 4d, 5s, 4f, 5f and 5p electrons. So, what are they? You know the binding energy of 4 electron is 763 this is what is there 763. 4p half that is down spin is basically 643 this is the one. 4p 3 by 2 half spin it is 547 you see the area ratios are 1 is to this is 2 is to 1. Then 4d you have a 3 by 2 that is down spin this d is corresponding to 2 l equal to 2. So, therefore, l uh, 2 minus half is 3 by 2 this is what is that this is coming around 353 uh, electron volts by energy and 5 by 2 will come 335 they are very close by area ratio is about how much is about 2 is to 3. Now, if you look at 4 f sorry 4 f. So, 4 f has 88 and 84 as a binding energies this is the one this is the one very close by 88 84. So, 5 by 2 is 3 minus half down spin and 7 by 2 is 3 plus half half spin area ratio is 3 is to 4. Then you have 5 p and others many times are not observed 5 f and 5 p is uh, very 5 p is observed 5 a is very close so it is not observed but not seen. Now, uh, we can actually use this you know uh, area ratios for quantitative analysis that is what has done. In this case we have used aluminum K alpha as a excess source. So, in case of OGR if you look at it the binding energy is for Lapox say I am not discussing here, but I will discuss later is N of O is 1116 electron volts. N5, N6, N67, we, are, we need to discuss. Let us not discuss about this part right now. Once we come back to OJ, we will discuss. So, uh, first let us see how we can identify peaks. Just like X-ray diffraction, here we can identify peaks. So, what is the general method? First is check peaks position and relative intensities of two or more peaks, both in case of XPS and OGL lines of an element checks the spin orbital splitting and area ratios of p d f. First thing is the peak position relative peak in cities or two or more peaks that is what you should do. Second thing is the spin orbital pit splitting uh, of our area ratios. So, let us see the following uh, things uh, here it is basically the plot is showing for aluminum and silicon you see this is coming for aluminum 2 s. So, we can actually know the peak position for T a 2 s what is the binding energy. So, binding energy can be calculated aluminum 2 p also silicon 2 s silicon 2 p, but it does not tell about what is the spin orbital splitting. Okay. So, to do that whether it is 2 p half or 2 p 3 by 2 we have one has to look into the area ratios. So, as you can see this is aluminum 2 p. So, therefore, this will be 2 p half and this will be 2 p 3 by 2 3 p, this will be 2 p 3 by 2 this will be small one will 2 p 3 by half silicon is also like that one can detect the and if you if you scan the whole thing there are many many peaks first thing is this you can find oxygen carbon chlorine silicon nit nitrogen silicon, all aluminum sodium so many peaks are observed. So, that is what the done by just checking the uh, peak positions. Second thing which you must know before even going proceed further is what is the sampling depth how much information is coming from what to the till what kind of you know depth of the sample. So, normally uh, this is again we use the same formula like x rays 
because it is XL penetration only, but electrons coming out after generation uh, from the sample surface. So, if we know the lambda i, i means for the particular element, inelastic mean free path of any element in a solid, we can do that. So, for a healing electron intensity of i0, which is created inside the sample as a depth d below the surface, the intensity is attenuated according to the Beer's lumbar law. We have already discussed Beer's lumbar law in EV visible spectroscopy. So, intensity I s, which is coming on the surface, is basically exponentially varies with dy lambda. So, with a path length of 1 lambda, okay, that is you know 63 percent of the electrons are scattered. This is very clear when d equal to lambda is basically when d equal to lambda is basically i s equal to i 0 divided by E. So, that means 1 by E of I 0 that is equal to 63 percent of I 0 that is what is said here. So, therefore, you must remember this formula it is I 0 exponential d by lambda not lambda by d ok. It is d by lambda lambda is the inastics mean free path of an electron and solid that you must have knowledge first you must have done. These are actually inelastic scattered electron, not elastic scattered electron, because these electrons are losing energies. So, therefore, one needs to know what is the mean free path of that. These are all available. Sampling depth is identified as a depth from which 95 percent of all photoelectrons are scattered by the time they reach the surface, correct. So, it is the depth from which 95 percent of the all the photoelectrons are scattered by the time they reach the surface. So, more lambdas are in range of 1 to 1 3.5 nanometer for aluminum k radiation. So, sampling depth at 3 lambda for XPS under this condition is about 3 to 10 nanometers that is pretty small about 100 Armstrong depth you cannot get more than that. So, if you have monolayer of 30 Armstrong ok this is how I actually get this is the depth in nanometers electron energy. As you see here depth is very high this is 100 this is 1000. As you say this is depth is high when you have binding energy is less as obvious there will be more kinetic energy of electron. As the binding energy reduces kinetic energy will be more so it will be coming out. As the binding energy increases it also decreases, but for a very high binding energy again there is a de increase that is because of the you know effect which is different from the inelastic scattering. This is basically universal curve. So, lambda actually depends on uh, the kinetic energy of photoelectrons and the specific elements this is that. So, as specific element means what type of element it is that is basically uh, the dictates the binding energy. So, now after knowing all these things because you know sampling depth now we know how the peaks to be identified. Let us see how quantitative analysis can be done. Now, in a XPS instrument measurements are accurate to the level of plus minus 10 percent it is not very accurate error is approaching by 10 percent. The intensity which is coming out of sample surface is a function of n i sigma i lambda i k. What is n i? n i is the average atomic concentration of element i in the surface under analysis that is what actually you want to measure i the intensity of electrons peak can be measured very easily n i is the average atomic concentration that is our variable or that is what is actually want to measure. So, sigma i is what photoelectron cross section is basically is called Schofield factor expressed by any peak position p lambda I have already discussed is the inelastic mean free path of photoelectron and k is all the other factors dumped in like for quantitative assignment you know EDS how uh, many other factors dumped in in EDX actually there are factors like you know atomic number difference the uh, flow sense all these factors are dumped in in a particular parameter same way k has all the other factors. So, basically frankly speaking intensity depends on the concentration of the element photoelectron cross section of the element and the inelastic mean free path of the photoelectron these three factors k is normally constant for any experiment. So, as if you know if this is measurable 
if you know these two parameters we can calculate ni that is what is the quantification done. Now how to measure this i that is what actually errors comes in and that is actually propagates into the analysis. So if you look at this intensity by the kinetic energy part peak shape is like this this is not a typical x-ray diffraction peaks little bit distorted. So one has to remove the background to calculate peak height if you fit the background like this like this one this is wrong if you fit the background like this this is also not best the best one is to fit the background like this that means background fitting is very important. So the, the standard measure on this sum instrument or full expression about the accuracy can be done if you have a standard but reproducibility is always very high here uh, for 2 percent. So worst case is in this measurement is this best one is this these are the middle that is why actually the human error comes into picture because depends it depends on how the measurement of the area depends on how you perceive the peak. Second important thing which you one is to consider for measurements of this quantum measurement is called transmission function which is basically related to the detector efficiency. So this is nothing but detection efficiency of an electron energy analyzer which is a function of electron energy. Transmission function depends on parameters of the electron energy analyzer such as pass energy to give you an, an idea if I have a pass energy of 8 electron 8 electron volts and this is the you know uh, the energies of the beam current uh, and this is done for gold after sputtering as you see the peak peak height here here is this much but when you have a pass energy of 20 electron volts peak height is this much. So that means the peak height or the area under peaks get affected by the pass energy pass energy basically the energy which is uh, used in the detector to energize is to get to the, the electrons can be detected very easily. So uh, this is what is basically dependent on the machine so but you must have a knowledge about that normally these are all very uh, you know fixed quantity for a particular setup but one must know what is pass energy how it can be controlled to get a good peak position peak of that. Now uh, what is Schofield cross section factor A this can be calculated for each element from a scattering theory basically basically for you know uh, basically for aluminum and magnesium calfor radiation and similarly lambda i is varies with the kinetic energy of the photoelectron it can be also estimated for universal curve which I have told you universal curve is this one this is the one this is lambda i this can be used to calculate all the lambda i's of different elements. Okay, so for a multi element system surface layer which is normally the case this is uh, we can write down the constants of element n i divided by n i plus n j plus k or j i j k are 3 elements. So this is how it is done i i, I divided by sigma i by lambda i divided by this is the whole thing the whole divided by this one this is for i this is for j this is for k as you say the, the factor which comes with capital K has nullified because of the ratio taking. So that is how actually done so I can also calculate nj now nj is nj divided by ni plus nj plus nk similarly nk can be calculated. Let us see how these are done some examples for oxide surface that is oxygen metal atomic ratio is determined for corresponding intensities MgO palletized one OS O2S by metal metal is basically mg mg here uh, 2p ratio is this much plus minus 10 percent ratio okay. Now uh, L2O3 is also like that SiO2 calculated Cu2O these are the different uh, you know oxygen atoms oxygen energy levels divided by metal energy levels ratios. So these are the measurements actually tells us how quantitatively intensities can be correlated. 